everyone for coming. I am filling in for Katie Ellis today, who has very essentially decided to stay home uh, because she has a cough, and that's great, and we should all do more of that. Um, so I'm going to just start by um, paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on, the uh, Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and acknowledging their leaders, past, present, and emerging. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce today's ACAT presentation, which is uh, Time Crisis, COVID-19 and the Temporality of Lockdown, which is being presented by Madison Magdalry and Dr. Francis Russell. Um, Dr. Madison Magdalry is an ECR and sessional tutor in Macassie at Curtin and their current research focuses on the intersections of feminism, femininities, and digital media in women's fitness and wellness spaces. And Dr. Frances Russell is the coordinator of the Bachelor of Arts Honours course at Curtin University. He's got a PhD in Literary and Cultural Studies from Curtin and researches the political and philosophical implications of mental illness alongside conducting broader research into neoliberal culture. So thank you very much and thank you. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the land on which we meet today, the Wajib Noongar people. Um, I would also like to pay my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging, um, and also acknowledge that um, sovereignty was never ceded here and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So we're all positioned to want to be well and to pursue the good life, which itself is defined and reproduced by a variety of different institutions. Medicine, corporations, and the state have often intertwined interests in what wellness should mean, what subjects are granted access to it, and how. When wellness and health are under unprecedented threat, uh, ways of being well or healthy can lose their discursive moorings. We're interested in discussing how COVID-19 may offer new ways of thinking about and constructing mental health and wellness, or wellness, um, in particular, Francis is going to discuss how the unique temporal conditions of lockdown may provide opportunities uh, for reconfiguring de uh, depression as a temporal issue rather than a mental illness as we know them. And then I'm going to talk about how COVID-19 um, intersects with the emergence of lifestyle gurus, uh, social media influencers who, as ordinary people, offer wellness advice based on anecdote and folklore um, and further reaffirm, reaffirm mental health as an individual problem to be corrected by surveilling oneself and structuring one's time. All right, take it away, Francis. Thanks very much, Maddie. Uh, so conventionally speaking, we do not think of depression as a problem of time. While the DSM-5 notes the differences in timing and duration uh, of depressive episodes, and states that paying attention to timing and duration can help us to delimit the specific type of depressive disorder in question, we find an emphasis on cognition and affect in the description of a depressive episode. To quote from the DSM-5, the common features of all of these disorders is the presence of sad, empty, or ir irritable mood, accompanied by somatic and cognitive changes that significantly affect the individual's capacity to function, end quote. Outside of psychiatric manuals, the popular discourse around depression sees it framed as either attitudinal or biological. For the propon proponents of widely used therapies like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, depression can be explained in terms of negative outlooks that produce negative interpretations of what are otherwise neutral events or events that could be seen as, as negative but not necessarily so. For the adherence of biological explanations of depression, which are also strikingly popular, depression has something to do with neurotransmitters or genes, though little evidence exists to provide a strong link between one and the other. Parche such, uh, such conventional discussions of depression, recent research by the psychiatrist Thomas Fuchs has attempted to reinvigorate the investigation of depression as a temporal phenomenon. Or to be more precise, Fuchs is interested in the possibility that depression relates to fundamental changes in our temporality. In this way, Fuchs is attempting to return to and to build on the early 20th century confluence of research between mostly Swiss and French psychiatrists, 
like Eugène Minkowski, Eugen Bleuler, Maydard Boss, and Ludwig Binswanger, and German and French philosophers such as Edmund Husserl, Henri Bergson, and Martin Heidegger. So in this portion of our talk, I would like to rehearse Fuchs' project outlining the phenomenology of depression that is emerging in his work and that of contemporary philosophers such as Matthew Ratcliffe before moving on to a discussion of the COVID-19 lockdown as a case study that potentially illustrates this broader discussion of philosophy and psychopathology. In developing this case study, I will draw on the Italian philosopher and social theorist Maurizio Lazzarato and his discussion of the temporality of debt and guilt. So while uh, such a short talk uh, could not outline Fuchs' entire uh, account of depression and temporality, there are two features that I would like to discuss. Uh, the first being the, phenomenology, uh, the phenomenological understanding of time uh, as a structure. And the second is the, the uh, relationality of time. So to be reductive for, for the sake of brevity, in phenomenology, time can be understood not as a discrete thing or entity that sits aside from other things and entities, but is instead the manner by which things appear. For phenomenology, I am temporal, things are temporal, and the world is temporal. Time is not added to me or to things, and therefore cannot be located prior to some hypothesized amount, uh, sorry, moment of addition. So time is not something that we can seize upon before things and then uh, add in some way. Things are just always already temporal. We find them to be temporal. Furthermore, to say that things are temporal does not mean to say that they simply change, but is instead to highlight the ways in which an implicit and pre-reflexive sense of pastness, nowness, and futurity structures our experience of things. The famous example used to illustrate this point is the perception of a melody. When I listen to a melodic line, I'm not perceiving a disconnected arrival of a present moment. I don't just hear notes randomly occurring. Uh, but I am also not assaulted by the cacophony of a simultaneous block of sound. I don't hear all the notes at once. Instead, I hear the present part of the melody as I retain the past sounds and I anticipate future ones. Again, it is important to emphasize that this is not something I have to consciously do, since things simply appear to me as happening now, but as having come from the past and tending towards the future, or as Fuchs point, uh, puts it, drawing on Husserl, there is a synthesis of retention, presentation, and protension that is implicit and pre-reflexive. Uh, so I, for those of you familiar with phenomenology, I, I apologize if that was very rudimentary. For those of you not, I apologize if that was very tortured, and I can explain more of what that means in the Q&A. So um, this observation that when we experience anything, we experience it as happening now, but with an unconscious implicit retention of the past, and an unconscious and implicit apprehension of something future that hasn't happened yet. This could seem obvious or even trite, uh, but is in fact incredibly useful for making sense of the pathochronologies of depression. As both Fuchs and Ratcliffe note, experimental studies suggest, quote, that depressed subjects consistently overestimate time intervals, end quote. That is to say, depressed subjects seem to experience time more slowly than non-depressed individuals in experimental conditions. Though perhaps more compellingly, sufferers of depression in non-experimental conditions report this experience consistently when interviewed. To quote a subject from one of Ratcliffe's studies, subject 49 states, and I quote, time goes very, very slowly. I remember laying awake at about 4 a.m. in my room and it was going so slowly. All I had to do was to get through to the morning so I could get some help, and it seemed almost impossible just to get through those few hours because time was taking so long." End quote. Sufferers of depression experience what is often referred to in psychiatry as psychomotor retardation, the slowing down of thoughts, speech, and bodily movements more generally. Sufferers of depression often feel incredibly tired, though this doesn't necessarily mean that they are able to sleep, with disturbances of sleep rhythms being quite common. As the historian Allegra Frixel has observed, Freudian-inspired approaches to psychopathology have tended to focus on a patient's past and of complications at the level of what Husserl would call retention, i.e. problems located in our capacity or incapacity to implicitly experience pastness, as can be detected in trauma and repression. So in 
The traditional psychoanalytic attempt to think through melancholia and depression, the problem is located in our inability for the past to be past. And instead, past which should be, the past which should be sort of implicit and unconscious keeps bleeding into the future in a symptomatic, sorry, into the present in a symptomatic way. By contrast, uh, and to quote, Phenomenological psychiatrists of the early 20th century, particularly Eugene Bloiler, uh, sorry, Eugen Bloiler and Eugene Aminkowski, uh, phenomenological psychiatrists theorized that patients were ill because their temporal relation to the future was diseased, end quote. Without an implicit sense of an open future for the sake of which activities are performed, it seems that not only does the depressed person lose their sense of motivation or canation or vitality, their active will towards projects in the future, but they also experience time as slowed down, uh, if not empty and endless. This presents us with an interesting alternative to the conventional emphasis on the past, whether that's past states of trauma, as in psychoanalysis, and it also provides an interesting alternative to uh, uh, focusing on existing attitudes and cognitions as we find in CBT. Rather than viewing either the past as causing the subject to return again and again to a repressed trauma through a codified symptom, or viewing the present schemas of the mind as having produced a negative outlook, CBT, phenomenological approaches to depression open up the possibility of exploring how the absence of an implicit or unconscious sense of open futurity can cause the past, present, and future to blur into an undifferentiated grayness, or for the past and present to collapse into one another, resulting in overwhelming feelings of guilt and indebtedness. And so in phenomenological psychiatry this is a, a, of depression, this is a recurring trope, this idea that either uh, we struggle to separate a sense of past, present, and future in the experience of depression, or we can only experience the present as dominated by the past in feelings of guilt or indebtedness to the past. <clears throat> so in this sense, the depressed subject interviewed by Ratcliffe, who awakes at 4 a.m. only to endure what seems like an endless deferral of the dawn, uh, provides an account strikingly similar to the subject of Philip Larkin's famous poem, Obeyed. On awaking at 4 a.m., the poem's subject is petri petrified by thoughts of impending death, and to quote from the first and second, second stanza, and I apologize in advance for subjecting you to poetry, but you know, indulge me. Um, I work all day and get half drunk at night. Waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. In time, the curtain edges will grow light. Till then, I see what's really always there. Unresting death, a whole day nearer now. Making all thought impossible, but how and where and when I shall myself die. Arid interrogation, yet the dread of dying and being dead flashes afresh to hold and horrify. The mind blanks at the glare, not in remorse, the good not done, the love not given, time torn off unused, nor wretchedly because and only life can take so long to climb clear of its wrong beginnings and may never, but at the total emptiness forever. The sure extinction that we travel to and shall be lost in always, not to be here, not to be anywhere, and soon nothing more terrible, nothing more true. So in about the poem's subject waits painfully for the break of dawn, not because of ruminations about past events, the good not done, the love not given, but because of an inability to conceive of the future. Once the thought of death has rendered an open future closed, predetermined and, quote, empty forever, the subject of the poem experiences a radically altered sense of past and present, Furthermore, with the, folk, with the foreclosure of an open future, the poem's subject finds themselves painfully aware of time as explicit and foregrounded. And this is, again, something that comes out in um, uh, interviews with depressed subjects, that time is something that is always explicit for them. They don't seem to be able to um, background time as something implicit. As temporality's distinct but related features of retention, presentation, and protention are transcendental, i.e. they are not given in experience, but they are the condition of possibility for experience. They cannot collapse without tearing down with them intelligibility to core. The experience of depressed people often appear counterintuitive or delusional from a sort of an outsider perspective, but they nevertheless have a structure and intelligibility that suggests an implicit and pre-reflexive sense of these three distinct but related features. So in phenomenological psychiatry, often in psychotic episodes or schizophrenia, 
past, present and future have broken down to the point where uh, subjects struggle to form coherent sentences, uh, cannot experience events in a way that other people can understand. Depressed people don't do this, so there is a, a still a sense in which uh, retention, presentation and protension is still there, but they blur and bleed into each other. Accordingly, the, phenom the phenomenological account of depression suggests not so much a collapse of the implicit distinction between the he heterogeneity of temporality, but rather the foreclosure of the implicit sense that the future is open. Put differently, the disappearance of a sense of open futurity can allow the past to painfully reassert itself into the present and thereby weaken the boundaries between the two. The past comes to insist in the conscious experience of the depressed person with a vividness that makes it as real, if not realer, than what to an external observer would seem truly contemporaneous. The depressed people often are ruminating on past events in a way that to others seems odd. Potentially, this reveals the relational character of retention, presentation, and protention in temporality. Rather than past, present, and future being fixed coordinates on a linear sequence of time, and rather than past and future being illusions that obscure the truly continuous present, phenomenological accounts of depression suggest that an implicit and pre-reflexive sense of past, present, and future are relational and co-constituting. Moreover, this relationality should not be limited to an analysis of the individual as if they are self-contained. For as we'll see, Fuchs argues that phenomenological accounts of depression reveal the significance of processes of intersubjective synchronization and desynchronization. So for Fuchs, while time is structural and not primarily something we experience, time's never out there, things are always happening temporally, uh, our implicit and pre-reflexive pre sense of temporality is not disembodied or solipsistic. Our sense of love, care, and hope are all future-oriented and emotionally propel us forward towards the future as something that is open. Fuchs cites research on child carer interactions, particularly very young children, uh, to articulate the manner by which young infants learn to orient themselves towards the future by way of imitating their carers during rhythmic, melodic interactions, imitating gestures, sound, and facial expressions. By imitating, children synchronize or literally enter into the time of their carers. And to reference uh, the famous line by Donald uh, W. Winnicott, uh, children learn from their carers that life is worth living. And there's a, a rich seam of literature by Bowlby and Winnicott on children that have not had these child care interactions, and um, they're far more prone to depression. So as Fuchs point, uh, uh, puts it, infants uh, move forward into a promising future because they feel co-temporal with caring adults who structure the world to be an inviting place, end quote. As adults, Hooke's argument continues that we look equally to mundane routines, major events, and the actions of those around us to orient ourselves temporally and towards an open future. In moments of desynchronization, where we find ourselves out of sync with our prevailing concepts of ourselves or with the activities of those around us, we are presented with the problem of resynchronization. By being in time with the actions, activities, and people of our milieu, time retains its pre-reflexivity and mostly structures our experiences. However, experience time, as Fuchs explains, is, quote, produced primarily through a disturbance or a negation, whether this be shock, surprise, pain, shame, or loss, through a rift in being, as it were, which interrupts the smooth continuity and breaks through the habitual, end quote. Once time has become explicit and foregrounded in our experience, we must actively resynchronize ourselves. Some moments of resynchronization are rather mundane, drinking coffee to be more alert and aligned with your busy coworkers, or having a glass of wine to relax after a day of work, but others are more challenging and demanding. As Fuchs puts it, some moments of desynchronization require us to find new ways of, quote, actively living time, end quote, and of once again learning to, quote, Tempor temporalize ourselves and at the same time prevent explicit time from dominating us so that we are not exposed to it merely passively, end quote. So depressed subjects often appear corporally desynchronized with those around them. As Fuchs notes, quote, 
Whereas conversations are normally accompanied by the synchronization of bodily gestures and gazes, the depressive's expression remains frozen and his emotional attunement to others fails, end quote. Uh, so depressed people literally struggle to synchronize with others around them effectively and corporally. Without an implicit sense of an open future, any attempt to get ahead of ourselves or to catch up with those around us become futile and potentially further intensify feelings of stasis and absence. As one becomes unmoored from an implicit sense of uh, being open to something new, ulterior or other, actions lose their structural frame of reference through which they appear as progressing. So without an implicit sense of future, we lose our ability for the present to be present and the past to be past as they're relational. Without a pre-reflexive sense that actions are open to the future, we instead experience torpor, going nowhere, unable to act, trapped in the past while others move on with their plans and projects. Indeed, in this book's notes, any remnants of implicit futurity seems to appear only in the past subjunctive. If only I had done, if only I had not done. In depression, the past, as opposed to the future, becomes the virtual space of possibility and novelty. Depressed people can only dream in the past. But unfortunately, these dreams are saturated by feelings of guilt and indebtedness. It's always, if only I had, if only I had not. So there are obvious links here between the risks of desynchronization and the COVID-19 lockdown. The disruption of routine, the secession of events, and the inability to plan or work towards future goals do not just disrupt our particular ambitions and actions, but they pose the risk of disrupting our capacity to comport ourselves towards the future. The intersubjective quality of temporality that phenomenologists emphasize suggests that our capacity to feel implicitly and pre-reflexively future-oriented emerges through uh, our synchronization with existing routines, relationships, and key events. While an essential worker is expected to continue their daily routine, commuting to work, working and returning home, the uncharacteristically busy supermarket of anxious shoppers, or the hospital ward emptied by cancelled elective surgeries, might provide a sense of being outside or removed from the rhythms of a normal day. With future milestone events cancelled, weddings, birthdays, graduations, so unfortunately not your milestone presentations if you're a PhD student, <laughs> one's connection to an implicit sense of futurity is threatened. For millions of unemployed people, the absence of income, routine, and a sense of identity can mean that thinking in futural terms is almost impossible. However, during lockdown, key opportunities for synchronization are also lost, not only due to the cancellation of activities and the suspension of normal life, but also because of the increased use of teleconferencing technologies to replace in-person interactions. So for many, the absence of clearly perceivable body language, facial expressions, and the typical rhythm of dialogue makes temporality explicit and reifies time, thus producing the risk of further desynchronization. Because of bandwidth limitations, the student or office worker might find themselves attending a meeting or a class uh, only of disembodied voices, resulting in a struggle to align themselves temporarily, tempor temporally with others. Sorry. So while the COVID-19 lockdown has been and continues to be concomitant with a great deal of suffering, not everyone who has faced struggles or pain during the time ex uh, experience uh, has uh, felt depression. This raises the question of why, out of the millions of people who have experienced loss and shock during the pandemic, some fall into depression and others do not do so. Following the work of psychiatrists like Fuchs and the phenomenological tradition that he draws influence from, this is perhaps not reduce reducible to the genetic or the neurological, nor to the cognitive or the behavioural. By locating the problem at the level of time, and time is a transcendental structure, we can potentially explain why experiences of depression are so resistant to being cognitively corrected, i.e. explained away, or behaviorally adjusted, taking up yoga, meditating, changing one's diet or habits. Uh, so again, if it's, a, if it's a, at a temporal level and structurally so, it might explain why depression is so resilient to being removed or eliminated, even if someone can consciously admit, of course I have a future, of course I can still do things, etc., etc. Interventions into the present are potentially limited if the problem lies with an inability to experience oneself and one's relationships to people and things as tending towards the future. David Foster Wallace's short story, Good Old Neon, illustrates this problem. The protagonist of the story, who is plagued by feelings of guilt and inauthenticity, 
and ultimately commits suicide, attempts a range of therapies, life experiences, and what we would today call wellness practices in order to try to cure their feelings of self-loathing. The protagonist states that they have tried in vain, and I quote, electroconvulsive therapy, riding a 10-speed to Nova Scotia and back, hypnosis, cocaine, sacro-cervical chiropractic, joining a charismatic church, jogging, pro bono work for the Ad Council, meditation class classes, joining the Masons, analysis, the Landmark Forum, the course in Miracles, a right brain drawing workshop, celibacy, collecting and restoring vintage Corvettes, and trying to sleep with a different girl every night for two straight months, end quote. Regardless of the activities undertaken, the protagonists cannot shake their feelings of inauthenticity or fraudulence. And, through the te uh, and, sorry, and though the text does not use this language, the protagonist appears unable to synchronize with other people. For example, during a meditation course, the protagonist is incapable of losing himself in the open flow of time, which is sort of the point of the course, and instead simply simulates meditation by being motionless for up, up to an hour, even earning himself the nickname The Statue, uh, even though during this time he experiences incredible pain. Quote, I experienced what felt like swarms of insects crawling all over my arms and shooting up out of the top of my skull, end quote. Unable to experience time as implicitly and pre-reflexively tending towards an open future, the protagonist instead finds himself trapped in an explicit present in which past feelings of guilt and inauthenticity spur him on ever more intensely to treat his life and self as an object to be consciously manipulated in the present. Endlessly trying to find a way to sync up with others, to be doing the right thing at the right time in his life, and therefore to lose his sense of inauthenticity or being out of step with others, the protagonist seems to only intensify his feelings of being self-consciously out of step with the going on around him. So not only are interventions into the present potentially limited, it is also unclear whether individual interventions at all or as such will be effective, effective given the intersubjective components of desynchronization analysed by Fuchs. It has long been acknowledged that industrial capitalism and colonisation have destroyed the temporalities of a great number of cultures. While neoliberal capitalism does not show any signs of abating this tendency, it is perhaps different or unique insofar as, it, uh, insofar as it makes such great use of debt as a mode of governance. As Maurizio Lazzarato notes, neoliberal capitalism has seen a vast expansion of debt as a means of prefiguring and shaping the actions of its citizens, or the future actions of its citizens. And this more or less annuls the future as open or novel, or annuls the future as such. In the utilisation of levels of debt to steer students away from the humanities and towards STEM fields, in the conservative and increasingly prominent argument that the unemployed owe an ob obligation to the taxpayer to accept all and any form of work if they are even to receive meagre forms of income support, and in the use of government deficits to justify austerity and further rates of social inequality, debt increasingly features as a means of governing populations and managing the future. Potentially, then, experiences of desynchronization will only become more widespread as economic and ecological crises threaten the production of even short-term routines and relationships. Perhaps for greater and greater numbers of people, time will present itself as an explicit problem, as something reified and static, and the future will appear only as an obstacle rather than as an open horizon. If this is the case, what we commonly refer to as depression and understand as a medical condition will become a more common uh, issue and techniques of time management will become more profuse. And this is going to lead into um, um, Maddie's excellent analysis. Moreover, the question remains as to whether such techniques will be able to reopen the future or whether they will simply petrify the past and present. And so uh, to, to conclude, I just want to end with a quote from the um, late psychoanalyst Michel de Muzin, who uh, died last year. Uh, quote, in medical pathology, the aim, whatever one says, is always to restore an earlier state that is better and akin to a state of non-illness that is supposed to have existed. Even if it has been secreted by the subject him or herself, illness occurs at a given moment, altering a situation that one would like to be able to restore. Thus, even when one is looking forwards in medicine towards a fortunate outcome, this is towards the, uh, and, and towards the future, one is necessarily looking backwards, 
reflection is retrograde. In analysis, things present themselves quite differently. The point of view, so to speak, is forward-looking, since the objective implicitly proposed is that what was only potential should become actual, that a freedom that was only virtual should assert itself, in short, that what has never existed should establish itself. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. That was great. Um, so just to connect our talks together, yeah, um, just to connect our talks together, uh, Francis and I, we're not arguing that, uh, you know, we're not specifically looking at uh, this idea that COVID gives you depression, um, but rather how COVID presents a series of events, um, material conditions um, seen through the pandemic that uh, highlights how we've come to normalize depression or in a particular set of ways. Um, what's really interesting, and this is very anecdotal, um, is how many people with depression or, or uh, with depression that are diagnosed with depression or anxiety report experiencing um, a resynchronization or, or rather people catching up with them during the pandemic, feeling normal again uh, because other people are, are desynchronizing. Um, in my section of this talk, I'm interested in examining accounts of time during COVID-19 in a genre of texts that present daily quarantine routines for an audience. As Francis points out, people who experience desynchronicity are often under pressure to resynchronize through mundane routine accounting for their time hour minute by minute to reshape the shapelessness they might experience. This interest in self-surveillance for the sake of health and wellness can also be described in part by investigating the quantified self-movement. While the kinds of texts I'm going to discuss are more accurately methods of self-monitoring rather than the more passive practices of data collection performed by um, self-tracking devices, I argue that the sentiment is much the same, disciplining the self through the intense scrutiny of bodily and social functions. Most of these texts I will discuss are created by influencers uh, documenting what works for them during quarantine, complete with ad breaks and product placement. Influencer involvement in lifestyle advice is not new to COVID um, and has been steadily developing over the past decade, as have academic responses. In particular, and I'm going to quote very heavily from this book through the talk, so get ready, um, Stephanie Baker and Chris Rojek's book, Lifestyle Gurus, which was published months before the pandemic, um, attributes this increasing trend to a crisis in confidence of experts and professionals where it seems easier and more sensible to trust evidence of someone who is friendly, beautiful, and authentic uh, than it is to face the Western medical industry and uh, associated um, paywalls and uh, disbelief and all kinds of things. So the term lifestyle guru, um, co coined by Baker and Rojek, uh, describes a particular genre of social media influencer ranging from traditionally known celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow, as well as the more ordinary individual, who dispenses lifestyle and wellness advice from a position of personal authority about what works for them. This includes diet, exercise, meditation, um, and frequently medical advice, alternative medicine such as naturopathy and homeopathy, and other technologies of being well and happy, like skincare, listening to audiobooks, journaling, scented candles, and so on. Um, just a note on the term guru, which uh, they do unpack in the book, but I want to spend a little bit more time on here. Um, guru is the Sanskrit term for master, guide, teacher, or expert. I mean, it's very commonly deployed in a lot of uh, yoga um, subcultures, or I should say subclasses. Um, I believe the use of this term in particular, and not expert or master, is significant in pointing out some of the more subtler brands of, huh, maybe I shouldn't say subtler, um, the brands of Orientalism deployed uh, in these movements. Um, the idea that the East holds more spiritual value, value and wisdom than the impersonal clinical care of Western medicine. It also describes how these influencers construct themselves as advisors and facilitators where the ultimate responsibility of adopting this advice is on the individual. According to Baker and Rojek, there is a normative template for the lifestyle guru which I'm going to discuss today. Maybe. Okay. Excuse me. 
Uh, apologies. Uh, arguably, many of these can apply to any and all influencers, with the notable distinction of being geared towards uh, promoting transformation through a specific way of living. First on the list, uh, the lifestyle guru must have a carefully constructed persona. Um, all influencers and uh, you know, Terry Senf and uh, Alice Marwick's uh, understanding of the micro-celebrity um, use and deploy authenticity in a specific way to make it seem better, more real, more whole. Um, and keep losing my thing. Um, so this, this persona not only refers to the ways in which an influencer must consciously self-edit uh, to convey a coherent sense of identity, which we all do every day, um, but also how their presence presumes an audience. The content they choose to construct is to be shown and has a specific aim. This idea of, of sharing one's life uh, with an audience presumes that someone is watching and thus changes uh, what is happening. A routine, a daily routine, um, is uh, when it is captured on video, is no longer something that someone does every day. It is um, something for an audience. Secondly, the lifestyle guru has a compelling narrative revealing transformation. There must be in their past something that made them dissatisfied with how they were living that triggered the new lifestyle they've adopted. Um, this is often illness or mental illness. Um, a really good and very complex example of this is the case of Belle Gibson, uh, who claimed to have had brain cancer. Um, she was an influencer. She had a, um, a book series called The Whole Pantry. She claimed to donate all this money to um, cancer charities. Um, she, she did not, and she was later found to uh, not have ever had brain cancer. Um, this was later, yeah, proven to be untrue, but this is, it's this kind of compelling narrative of transformation and self-help that was so charismatic as to be convincing, even to her book publishers who failed to fact-check her claims. The transformative narrative uses time to give value to the lifestyle and provide evidence for the solutions. Thirdly, in the template of the lifestyle guru status, and again, I think this is um, a very, very common element of any influencer, um, is the offering of attractive images to sell the good life. Um, these images can be of the self, of the body, um, but very also uh, their life. Um, and I want to look specifically at how people's bedrooms uh, construct that in the um, things I'm about to show you, which um, I'll, I'll bring up the Jordan Peterson reference later. Um, okay, so this conveys a sense of a good life um, as a state that they have achieved or have at least achieved in part. Something really crucial about the lifestyle guru is that they frame themselves as not perfect, um, and of course that is what they want you to believe that they are so that you adopt their lifestyle and, and buy their products. Um, so lastly, the lifestyle guru uses metrics as supporting evidence. Um, steps per day, heart rate, weight, and so on, analyzed in unprecedented detail through devices. I will also argue that time is used as a metric in some of uh, my examples. This use of metrics corresponds to the quantified self-movement and is, according to Baker and Rojek, particularly prominent among male gurus uh, who emphasize biohacking and this very particular pseudo-scientific discourse of um, disciplining the body. The quantified self movement, according to Deborah Lupton, describes a shift towards emphasizing body metrics and data collected <coughs> through devices to monitor and discipline the self. And these include fitness trackers, uh, sleep trackers, and so on. Um, there's just so many now. Uh, so this shift sees health, health as a temporal field where data is measured over time to complete a picture of the self, to complete an identity. Um, and this is constantly under construction and assessment. Time puts the metrics into context. Again, beats per minute, hours of sleep, steps per day. Um, focusing on really macro details of the body um, as a way of understanding who you are and what you can do. My examples are not so much about the generation of data, um, although being on YouTube, they certainly do that, but about the culture in which we're positioned to manage and construct ourselves through data and how this is offered to us as a way to the good life. In addition to the characteristics outlined here, I'd also argue an element of confession and disclosure uh, is necessary in constructing a lifestyle guru persona um, as a way of engineering closeness to the viewer and enrolling their audience in a particular regime of truth. According to Baker and Rojek, while, share, uh, quote, while sharing their personal experiences can provide consolation and assist those who have endured similar hardships, 
Much self-disclosure is manufactured online in the quest to attract followers and increase viewer engagement. It's this, uh, this mode of self-disclosure, self-confession uh, that uh, really, I think, sets uh, the lifestyle guru apart from what is seen as traditional medical authorities. Um, you wouldn't expect a traditional medical authority, a doctor, um, to say, yes, I have these problems too. Here's how to deal with it. Um, and in that way, if that's ever happened to you, you kind of feel closer to that person, that they understand you a bit better. Um, Right, so uh, the kinds of confessions that uh, Baker and Rojek refer to are more spectacular. They're talking about things, uh, I don't think they specifically mention um, the makeup artist uh, Nikki Tutorials, um, came out as, as trans earlier in the year, or the extreme end of uh, Belle Gibson's reveal as um, a fraud. Um, but I also argued that this continued confession of being not perfect in smaller, more relatable uh, ways maintains this confessional private connection. Things like being messy or, oh, that workout sucked, which I'm going to show you. So these, uh, these kinds of figures emerge from what Baker and Rojek call a low trust society, where medical and government authorities are not seen as holding or able to hold truth. It is easier to, uh, in this low trust society, trust the presumed intimacy of an attractive, friendly, and apparently transparent, or someone who is committed to transparency, a figure who allows you to peek into their daily lives to see the real effectiveness of their lifestyles. The turn to lifestyle gurus for advice is symptomatic of new conceptions of self selfhood and the growing distrust of experts and elites. Much of the success of lifestyle gurus is also owed to therapy culture, um, which is con constituted by the prevalence of things like self-help books, uh, the notoriety and trust in figures like Oprah and Dr. Phil, and the popularization of continued work on the self assisted through trusted elites. And, and again, Jordan Peterson um, and his ilk represent something like that. In post-modernity, these figures are more open to scrutiny than ever before, thinking things like Me Too, where men are consistently, you know, men in positions of power are consistently revealed as abusers, um, which leading, leads us to trust, or more likely to trust, ordinary people who seem to have, yeah, a, a representation of, of confidence, um, but authenticity as well. These are ordinary people like us, um, and they are more understanding and capable of helping us become well. So let's, uh, let's watch some videos. Uh, turning to the case studies themselves now, uh, there are three YouTube videos I want to examine and unpack as they relate to how lifestyle gurus use time to convey uh, advice about what constitutes wellness. All three use life sharing techniques that use parasocial interactions to presuppose an audience. They talk to their camera, they talk to you, and in a way that they're just, they're giving you advice. Um, they're not, uh, they're, they're very much just talking about what works. Um, and in this particular case, uh, the audience that they're presupposing is a consuming audience. They also illustrate what Baker and Rojek see as affirmative perfectionism, where the gurus and their content are aspirational, but they do not claim to be better than their followers and are more interested in maintaining a connection where it's plausible that anyone could be a guru, just as the gurus themselves are always learning and always in a project. Like us, they're interested in what works, suspicious of professional opinion, and they maintain a sense of openness and vulnerability. Lifestyle guru advice is grouped around specific crises. Individual illnesses are the most obvious, including things like food sensitivity, it's really common, um, fatigue, chronic illness, um, and also um, anxiety and depression and other symptoms of stress. However, in the context of COVID-19, which happened months after the publication of this book, lifestyle advice is increasingly based on how to survive the pandemic. Of course, in terms of the illness itself, but that's not quite what I'm interested in here, but particularly around being locked down and this idea of the, the future being foreclosed or even put on pause. As Francis said earlier, quarantine can seemingly foreclose the future, bringing with it listlessness, anxiety, and depression. Lifestyle gurus are interested in fighting against this, uh, sharing what works for them, and much of this is about corrective behavior to do with accounting for one's time. If, as Francis argues, the past, present, and the future blur together for depressed individuals and is experienced out of sync with others, these videos offer solutions to resynchronize by monitoring the self 24 7. 
So I'm going to play short clips for three of these videos and then talk through some overlapping themes as well as differences. Okay, who have I got? All right, so this first one is from YouTube user Teach Men's Fashion, or Jose Zunigas, Zunigas um, whose account mostly revolves around giving men advice about masculinity. Ostensibly, the focus is on fashion and style and grooming, um, but there are also many videos about how to pick up women um, and how to be attractive overall, most of which revolve around particular ideas about how to be a man. The videos include things like, um, you know, the, the eight things that you shouldn't do that uh, aren't attractive or something like that. Um, Teach Men's Fashion has a following of 4.83 million, um, and this video, which is called Why I Wake Up at 4 a.m., My Quarantine Routine, has around 400 likes. I'm going to show you um, just the first couple of seconds and then uh, a good chunk in the middle, um, and I'll also sort of flash you through what he's doing in his day. Here we go. Ah. This pandemic is going to be a here of rugged individualism, uh, neoliberalism, and this idea that you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and the only thing stopping you is you. 
Um, so uh, that's obviously, and I'm going to comment on sort of the gendered uh, differences in lifestyle gurus um, when I show you the other ones. Um, but that's that's a very um, almost aggressive example of how uh, time is used. He says, like, I'm ahead of you now. Like, I'm four hours ahead. Um, and uh, and in, in the beginning, uh, when he's doing his uh, 4, 4 a.m. run, um, he even talks about everyone in, in their houses asleep. You know, you idiots. Um, all right, so let's look at another one. Did I do it? OK, so this is another example uh, from, this is a YouTuber called Lauren Snyder, who has a following of 300K. Um, and this video has 2 million views, which I find interesting, that contrast between her followers and uh, the views for this video, which is kind of reverse to um, Teach Men's Fashion. Snyder, an American student in Sydney, documents her 6 a.m. morning routine uh, on the 22nd of March, which is just sort of on the cusp of when everything was kicking off. But I think a little bit, uh, it, it, it was in place during um, this time in Sydney. What's interesting to note about the size of the likes for this vid uh, compared to her overall following is that many of the comments suggest that people watch this as a way of relaxing, um, which I find really interesting. Um, they watch it for its soothing qualities rather than for specific advice, uh, which suggests negotiative reading practices uh, outside of what the audience is presumed to be watching for. All right, so I'm just going to show you some bits from this one. I like to do that while we it's Good six. Morning, it says guys. five, but it's six. So today I'm going to walk you guys through my 6 a.m. morning routine. I do not get up at 6 a.m. every single day, but just on the days that I want to be extra productive or just get a lot done and have kind of a bigger to-do list, I like to get up at 6 a.m. and get my day started. So the first thing I do is just reach over and drink lots of water. I always have my cold hydro flask right next to me so I can drink up, just get the metabolism going, and it's so refreshing in the morning. And then I like to head straight over to my desk and do some morning journaling. This has been a part of my like New Year's resolution is to just do more writing, whether it's gratitude or just, you know, morning pages, anything like that, just to kind of like get my day started off on the right foot and feel a lot more refreshed. And I like to put on my Spotify music in the background and just kind of zen out and be a little bit away from my screen, especially to the start of my morning. And then I head over to this little, what I like to call my brain dumping notebook, and I'll just create a to-do list for the day. I just find that this helps me stay on track and just makes me like feel a lot more organized knowing that I have all these things that I want to get done and just putting it from my head to paper makes it a lot easier for me to physically see what I want to accomplish throughout the day. Then it is time to head into my morning self-care. A lot of it I do in the shower, which I'll show you guys later on. But before anything else, the first thing I do is brush my teeth. Of course, I want to have fresh, good, smelling breath. And then I just head back to my room and make my bed. I love making my bed. It makes my room look so clean. And also, first things first, it doesn't make me want to just like crawl back in and have my bed. So always make the bed. It looks for clean look. And then I just head over to my closet and grab some workout clothes. This is a set from Lululemon that I love to wear. Um, so she's well. going to the gym. And I do 5.8 miles per hour, but this was obviously in kilometers per hour. And then, like I said, it depends on what I'm feeling. So today I wanted, really wanted to wash my hair. And Again, we're, my we're going in the shower. About my recent hair care right into my room to get started on doing my skincare and getting ready for my day. I really, really don't do a okay, we've got multi the vitamins and then a probiotic. <laughs> um, breakfast. And this is just her morning. This isn't her entire day. Um, and what else have we got? And that's pretty much it. And then she goes to uni. OK, um, so I'm going to comment on some, on some similarities and differences um, once I've shown you the last ones. But we can start to see some themes appearing of this um, 
like the sense of taking care of the self as the self is conflated with the body. When people talk about self-care in these videos, they talk about um, showering, actually, I think is, is kind of what they're saying. Showering, <laughs> brushing your teeth, skin care, um, which is a really interesting uh, motif, I think. Um, all right, so let's watch the last one. And this one has an interesting emphasis on um, on not being perfect. I don't know if this is going to work on here, but it, I've got it on YouTube. OK, I'm just going to have to exit out of that and show you the YouTube video. Apologies. So this is uh, Lavender, or Eileen, um, who has a following of 1.17 uh, million. Um, this video, quarantine vlog, life at home, and what I've been doing has 105,000 views, which is not that much compared to some of the others. Lavender's videos focus around uh, her journey to self-love uh, through meditation, journaling, self-care. Uh, in this case, not showering. Uh, I mean, she does shower, but uh, self-care is not specifically conflated with showering uh, to Lavender. And astrology. So I'm just going to play you some of this to get a sense of that kind of um, confessional vulnerability that she conveys. Hey guys, so I wanted to show you what I'm actually doing while in quarantine. I think the point I want to make is it's okay if you want to be productive, but it's also okay if you don't want to be productive. There's no obligation to be productive right now. It's okay to not feel guilty. Don't feel bad if you're just doing nothing because during this crazy time, it's okay to just be, just exist. You are perfect as you are. Be kind and gentle with yourself and that's what matters most during this time. It's okay to be a little messy. This is where I put all the clothes that I'm wearing on repeat. All the sweaters and sweats I wear indoors. That chair is for outdoor wear when we have to go out very rarely to get groceries. This is my aesthetic. Oh. So some days I just stay in my PJs, but to not feel like a total slob, I usually change into some workout clothes so that I feel a little bit more motivated to work out sometime during the day. So I've cut up a lemon and I put it in this mason jar so I have these lemon slices on hand. Then I squeeze it in my water because lemon has vitamin C and it helps boost your immune system. So hot water with lemon in the morning is good. I have three packaging, one website, and I have four of them. This is uh, breakfast. I usually use whatever food I have today. There are apples, grapes, bananas, and I'm adding a little plain yogurt with a little bit of agave. Mix the agave in with the yogurt, and then I'm adding my favorite granola. I'll do the best. Got work. I've been loving the app yoga. Down for yoga because it's so customizable. Today I'm doing a Hatha Yoga Flow to dress up on a Saturday because it felt like a beautiful day, the weather was nice, we were streaming music and hanging out with friends. We've been hanging out with friends on house party pretty often and I think it got her two years Repots old, so small, and now she's basically my height. So to repot right. your plant, you're supposed to put rocks on the bottom. I realized we didn't have enough rocks because this pot is pretty big, it's a 14 inch, and then you add soil, after adding soil, you're supposed to deroot your plant for the transfer. Okay. So, returning to PowerPoint. All right, so some of the themes that we can uh, draw from the three videos are cleaning the immediate environment, um, similarly, or, or at least acknowledging how the immediate environment affects us. And again, as I said uh, before, um, this strongly links back to people like Jordan Peterson, who um, in 
claims for this like rugged individualism say that you know you need to be responsible for cleaning your room and, and doing things like that is going to uh, make you a good person or make you well. Um, so we can see things like making the bed um, is an emphasis, uh, things like uh, wearing exercise clothes to motivate yourself. Um, all three contain ads. Uh, they all have affiliate links um, down the bottom of each uh, YouTube video um, to all the products that are mentioned by name. So this, again, the presumed audience is, audience is a consuming audience. Um, Lavender and Lauren don't log specific units of time beyond when they wake up, but they do organize time through events. You know, bed, uh, like make the bed at, at when you get up, like what time is gym time, what, when is workout, what is breakfast, um, when is lemon water. Um, Etc. Um, there's a really uh, ambiguous relationship with social media. I don't think I quite captured that in the um, scene that I wanted to show you from Lauren Snyder's, um, but many of them talk about how they need time away from their screen while using their screen. Um, which again, like, calls for us to identify with that. Like, oh yeah, I, I too want to be away from my screen, she says, like, on the screen watching a video. Um, there's product placement, she's talking about the Hydro Flask, a particular brand of, of journal, so on. Um, and what I find really interesting across all three is this tone of discovery and personal preferences. Like, you know, traditional or, or older forms of self-help might have relied on evidence-based things, like, you know, this is proven in this, in this journal, research has shown that vitamin C is, is important, so you need to have lemon water after uh, waking up. Um, but this is like, they're the first person to discover, um, you know, what it's like to drink a lot of water, or what it's like to go to, um, go to the gym. Um, and again, it's about what works for me. All three um, emphasize work it, uh, workout sorry, and diet. Um, are They're both attended to as well as anything else going into the body, the lemon water. Um, and Teach Men's Fashion and Snyder both take the viewer into the shower and show what goes on the body, linking it to productivity very much. Um, Teach Men's Fashion is inviting his audience to inspire him, uh, to aspire to him, sorry, and his discovered practices. Again, like you're the first person that's read an audiobook. Um, but he seems to suggest that his practices elevate him uh, among other people where Lavender and Lauren do not. Um, and he's talking about, like, I'll be three, four hours ahead of everyone. Uh, you know, everyone else is asleep, that kind of thing. Um, and there are practices of confession I mentioned before where Teach Men's Fashion says that sucked after the workout, despite being absolutely shredded. Um, and Lavender is showing us her messy room where all the clothes are folded very neatly. Um, although Lauren Snyder doesn't specifically mention the pandemic here, there's an emphasis on all three and needing to overcome. Um, well, while Lavender claims that she wants to be gentle with herself, shift away from uh, forcing herself to be productive, the act of making the video itself is productive. It's work. Um, and in fact, it makes her money. Um, again, it presumes an audience uh, and is for her work. For Teach Men's Fashion, the pandemic will weed out the weak in a show of aggressive and individualist sort of Darwin uh, Dar Darwinism. Um, for all three of them, the structure of the day, even if it's not productive, is what corrects their feelings about the pandemic. Baker and Rojek argue that lifestyle gurus purport to offer solutions to problems that are psychologically experienced as intractable and overwhelming. This is reinforced by the popular sentiment that fragmentation and division in the world is now moving into a higher stage of unprecedented complexity and acceleration. So uh, I think I'm kind of running out of time, but I just want to scroll you through uh, the second case study I'd look, like to look at, which was a tweet by a user, Hot Girls for Bernie, um, uh, whose name is Jocelyn, uh, whose quarantine schedule prompted all these sarcastic um, and revealing responses to the kind of um, what is termed rise and grind culture, um, which is this behavior correction and containment that this text represents. OK. Oopsie. Ah, oh, I was supposed to put that on. No, it's all right. Okay, so here um, she's saying, this is just a general guide for myself based on my goals and what works for me. So there's this incredible sense of individualization. I'm allowing a lot of flexibility with myself and not pressuring myself to compete, uh, complete everything. This is just to give me structure and a sense of control and stability. So what matters here is not really what she gets done. And I think Lauren Snyder comments on her to-do list as well. Um, the, the, the aim is not to tick all these things off. And Lavender also says, you know, she needs to be gentle and flexible. It's about structuring, making a structure, and accounting for yourself. Uh, so some of the things in uh, um, 
Jocelyn's list, you know, 7 a.m. wake up, she has skincare, she stretches, she makes her bed, she eats breakfast, she gets stressed. Uh, there's things like something for the soul, something for the brain, something for the heart. And they're all fairly flexible. Um, the, she, she gives herself options, but still those options are all accounted for. After responses stating that these are unachievable goals uh, for those with mental illness, um, for many of the reasons that Frances outlined, she defends herself by disclosing and confessing her own major depression and stating, perhaps unsurprisingly, that this is a way of keeping herself in check and, in, my, or in our terms, resynchronizing. She also connects with an audience here. I'm just like you. This is what works for me. As with the videos, there's a strong sense here that although she is an ordinary person, she is compelled to share her advice as aspirational for others. The tweet, you know, this is just what works for me, presumes an audience who values this kind of advice through life sharing. Some of the responses satirize the attempt to regulate one's emotions in and through time and highlight the difficulty of doing this in the particular environment of COVID-19. So from Kevin Farzad, he says, my quarantine routine, and he's mocking this presentation. I just wanted to share what works for me. This is just to give me structure and a sense of stability. 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., wake up and stare at my phone. And so here we see like that collapse in time that Francis was talking about. Uh, nine and two are not organized under any events except you know, the continue like blurred together um, event of waking up and staring at your phone. Um, the next one. Uh, separates blocks of time um, and shows how he tries but fails to meet the standards set by rise and grind culture. So you've got 4 p.m. is yoga, prayer, meditation. 4.01 p.m. is drinking, smoking, and sending nude photos. Um, so there's this really sarcastic sort of irony used to parody this, um, which I, I think is very interesting. Um, the, the last one is more of like your, your traditional kind of intertextual parody, um, again, highlighting the ridiculousness of this timeline um, and with the last line conveying also a sense of repetition of events, which kind of makes the rest of it funnier. <laughs> so what these case studies show me as a genre of uh, quarantine routine texts, and again, I see them, I, I haven't said this before, but I do see them as texts, as narratives, um, is the role of the lifestyle guru during COVID-19 as guide and facilitator of structure during structurelessness. Accounting for and surveilling your time in these cases apparently has the capacity to correct the seemingly insurmountable collective condition of being in a pandemic. Thank you.